My name is Todd Hohauser, and I'm your facilitator today for our discussion on the team, the team, the team. And thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to start off by just telling you a little bit about myself and the panelists. I'm going to throw the panelists a curveball because I told them I was going to do something in a certain fashion, and I'm just changing it on the fly just to see how, they're, how good they are at improv. And then we're going to go into a, a little bit about some specific topics that we've established and also have time for Q&A that you might have. I'm sure that all of the panelists would enjoy any questions. So if a thought does elicit a question, just go ahead and raise your hand and uh, we'll get the microphone to you because we'd rather have it be interactive than just um, sitting here and lecture. So as I said, my name is Todd Hohauser. I'm the president of Harvey Hohauser and Associates. We're a retained executive search firm, which is just a highfalutin way of saying that we're headhunters. And for 28 years, we've worked with entrepreneurs and privately owned businesses here in the state of Michigan to recruit their top talent. I want to introduce some of the, the, the distinguished gentlemen to my left. And I'm going to re yeah, where is it? <laughs> read, read some bios, and this is where the curveball is. So after I read their bio, I'd just like each panelist to give a quick thought or idea about the topic, which is choosing partners for your executive team. So once I give your bio, then you can just give a quick okay. thought. So to my immediate left is Dick Beaton, who is the founder and CEO of Amplifinity. Dick has been the principal financial and strategic architect in the successful formation, funding, growth, and sale IPO of three technology companies that transformed the markets they served. Dick is currently the founder and CEO of Amplifinity. The Amplifinity social sales and marketing technology platform helps clients such as DirecTV, ADP, Sony, turn customers, employees, and affiliates into powerful sales and marketing channels that drive peer-to-peer -peer referrals and other brand advocacy. Amplifinity is transforming the way brands acquire new customers. Dick was founder and CEO president of University Netcasting from January of 1993 to January of 2000. University Netcasting merged with Student Advantage and had a successful IPO that raised over $80 million, I'll take some, and had a combined market capitalization of over $1 billion. University Netcasting builds and manages the athletic websites of almost all the Division I athletic departments. The company was purchased by CBS in 2005. Prior to Amplifinity, Dick led the acquisition and subsequent sale of entire doc prep to Wolters Kluwer Financial Services. Under Dick's guidance, Entire created the mortgage industry's first leading web services document creation and management software product, X4, or times four. X4. X4, all right. Dick's held several sales and sales management positions in technology industry, including positions at IBM, Prime Computer, and Horizon Technology Incorporated. He has a lifelong passion to better understand how to make the sales process more efficient. Dick also serves on the board at GDI, the LDFA, the Ann Arbor YMCA, and the Growing Tree. He is a graduate of the University of Michigan. Please welcome Dick Beaton. So Dick, as we kind of discussed and prepped, just a few couple quick thoughts about uh, the team and recruiting the team for entrepreneurs. And hopefully that's on. Yeah, I'm, I got a lot of voice anyway. But um, I started uh, all my career right out of college in 76 with IBM in California. Um, I, I left IBM to go start a reseller group at a company called Prime Computer out in California. And all we did is sign up venture-based software companies um, from about 1982 and until I left there and started my own company. Um, so I'm very familiar with the Valley Venture Capital. Um, I raised about 13 rounds of funding myself for my company. I've been around in about 30 of them. And the one thing you're gonna hear from everybody, it's just different ways to look at it. Anybody that's got a brain is gonna find the best people they can get. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're gonna start a company and you, you want to create a whole new market. You're going to need some really smart people 
to help you and people that are good at their operational areas. And the better, the smarter they are, the better your chance for success. It's a very simple formula. And <laughs> so, thank you. The first thought. Okay, to Dick's left is Richard Bruder. Richard is counsel at Dean and Fulkerson. Richard helps entrepreneurs attract and negotiate funding from angels and venture capitalists. He also helps angel investors and venture capitalists make better deals by protecting the downside. He developed the Enterprise Council Program, a fixed fee retainer based system for helping entrepreneurial clients grow their businesses. Under Enterprise Council, he becomes the entrepreneur's in-house counsel because most services are covered by the retainer. Enterprise Council takes the billable hour fee out of quality legal advice. Good idea. Wow. <laughs> he, also created, he also creates advisory boards for his clients, non-fiduciary boards of directors, so that his clients can benefit from the strategic planning and collaborative thinking that a board provides. Richard has been practicing corporate law for 30 years, representing all manner of funding sources and growing companies, both publicly traded and privately held. One of the top 10 students in his graduating class from Wayne State Law School, I won't give him the year, I'll leave that alone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. He went on to receive a master's in taxation degree from Wayne State University. Entrepreneurs are risk takers who change the world and make a positive difference in people's lives. His goal is to be a part of that mission by helping entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs grow, thrive, and realize their vision. Please welcome Richard Bruder. Thank you, John. Richard, some initial well, thoughts? Yeah, I'm glad you didn't get the year, first of all, because I knew there were 11 people in that class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So to build on what, what my colleague Dick here said, this team building is the most important thing you'll do for your business. In many respects, it's almost more important than the idea itself, is building the team. So you really have to be proactive about it. It's an art as well as a science. And you have to look hard at your own self, where your gaps are, uh, where the gaps are in your team, and make sure you fill them. <clears throat> the idea of picking the team, assigning the roles, dividing the equity, it's a dynamic process. It's not one and done. You know, when you file the articles and do the initial minutes, it's not over at that point. It should grow with the contributions and the roles of the people throughout, throughout time. And then the lawyer in me has three words, vesting, vesting, vesting. <laughs> so, we'll get to that. We'll get to that, I'm sure. Thank yeah. Thanks. Next to Richard is Andrew McCullum, who is the Commercialization Project Director at Michigan State University. A 30-year international career in technology-based startups and innovation. The first 20 years were engaged in pioneering modern telecommunication systems in North America, England, and Brazil. And anybody here speak Portuguese? Because Andrew says he's fluent. <laughs> Oh, there we go. <laughs> Fantastic. The last 10 years have been dedicated to university technology commercialization in subject areas from cancer to concrete, protonomics, which I can't even pronounce, to proton beams. The overriding theme has been the implementation of innovations from the lab bench to fully functioning products which fulfill a customer need. Other consistent themes are the ability to adapt to new environments, technologies, and cultures, and the achievement of timely, on-budget results with diverse groups of people. Please welcome Andrew McCullough. Some thoughts. Thanks, Todd. Yes. Um, I'm an engineer. I should be able to work the technology. Cool. Anyway. Um, most of my background is really in doing the zero to 100 stage of startups. So that in any startup, there's various sort of, of stages that you go through. And, and the first sort of one is the zero to 10 or zero to 100 sort of employees. That's what mostly I've done, although I did take one up to 600. Um, and just as sort of, I, I don't want to keep repeating on the sort of common theme, but um, just regarding the importance of the team and the team building and so on and so forth. When it's good, it's really, really good. And when it's bad, it really sucks. So it, it's, it's important to, and it, it's, as was, was pointed out, it's a very dynamic situation and it changes a lot, particularly in the first sort of zero to 10 employees, which is usually what causes most people most heartburn. Because if you've got 
three employees, you add one, you just increase the size of your company by a third. Right? So uh, that's why it's, it, it, it requires a lot of attention early on. It always requires a lot of attention. So usually once you get up to 50, 100 employees, that sort of thing, there's more support around you, there's more structure, there's more things you can do. But those first 10 or 20 employees are just absolutely make the break. Thank you, Andrew. And finally, Paul Horst was a CEO of Algal Scientific. Paul Horst's career spans more than 35 years in executive management of technology ventures. He founded and took public Nematron Corporation, an industrial computer company. He also led the formation and growth of DTE Energy Technologies. He served as a board of director of several subsidiaries and investments by DTE Energy and on the initial advisory board of Next Energy in Detroit. Mr. Horst currently serves as the chairman of Algal Scientific Corporation. They produce high value bioproducts via sterile fermentation of algae and in a related process uses algae to remediate and recover nutrients from high strength process water. Really simple stuff. <laughs> he was recognized as a young entrepreneur of the year in Michigan and received the Alumni Medal of Merit in Chemical Engineering from the University of Michigan. He is a guest lecturer on entrepreneurship at the University of Michigan. With his family, he's logged over 25,000 miles of blue water sailing and participated in Expo 98 Round the World Rally. So we'll go sailing later today. It's perfect weather for it. His Bachelor of Science in Engineering is a chemical engineering degree and MBA are both from the University of Michigan. Please welcome Paul Horst. Paul, some, some thoughts. Andy can't get the microphone to work here. Be loud. I'll, I'll try to be loud. Yeah. Um, just a little bit of context. The, the first two companies I was involved with, the Nematron company was really a startup right out of college where we had the two or three people and no money and bootstrapping it. And there's a lot of lessons learned when you're doing it at that point. The second, um, after doing a lot of selling, was that DT Energy that had 10,000 employees and deep pockets, but this was a um, a new subsidiary they're forming. And there's quite a bit of difference in dynamics when you're trying to build a team you know, within a large Fortune 500 company that still has to be entrepreneurial. Um, Andy talked a little bit, or you know, mentioned the 0 to 10, 0 to 100. Um, yeah, I'd like to expand on that just a little bit. The skill sets that are required from 0 to 10 and then 0 to 100 change quite a bit. In fact, probably once you get beyond 100, then there's no skill set. And so when you're thinking in terms of recruiting people to help you, you really have to recognize what your own skill sets are and the gaps, so to speak, and being realistic. Um, and in fact, saying, you know, maybe I've got the greatest technology in this company, but I don't understand finance, or I don't understand sales. And just to accept the fact that you may have to hire somebody uh, to take those roles and maybe even take the place as CEO of your company. Paul, that's, a, that's actually a great place to start. It's like you read what I sent out or something. It just teed me up perfectly. Because I think when you look at an inventor or a scientist or a founder or technician who's created some great new idea, you have to think about the best practices of bringing on this sort of business talent that Paul was just talking about. So I'm wondering if the panel could kind of chime in here and maybe talk a little bit about best practices when you're the inventor, the founder, the technician, and you're looking at adding on whether it's a salesperson, CFO, what have you, and if you could share some thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, Is it working? Closer. Yep. Don't be afraid of it. So you have to hire people that aren't like you. Um, the functions in a business are totally different. So if you're an engineer and you want your sales guy to act like an engineer, you're going to fail. Uh, if you're a sales guy and uh, you want your engineer to not be very technical and you want him to act like a sales guy, you're going to fail. Um, so the bottom line is you're going to have to really open your mind and try to not surround yourself with people that are like you. It's very important to be honest and open with yourself and realize the type of people that you need to fill the roles 
that your business needs. And that's really key. Um, it was a mistake I made in the beginning. I've seen people make it all the time. And uh, that, that, that's basically the first thing I would tell you. Any other thoughts? One of, the, one of the things that we had discussed before, you look at uh, a startup, big company versus small company. You know, if you have a, a, tech, a biotech company, what's to stop you from going to take somebody from a big Fortune 500 biotech? Will that ever be successful? Any thoughts on that? I think some people would say it'll never be successful. Uh, I qualify that just by saying when we're looking for people, we would try to find somebody that came with some type of experience in a small environment. Either they worked in a small company at some point in their career or their family had a business, just because you need to have that understanding of what it takes to be an entrepreneur. And if you always work for a large company, um, you may never get the experience that you need to have of you know, working the long hours and giving up the evenings and all those things. Uh, a few years ago, I interviewed somebody who'd worked for one of the auto manufacturers for something like about 15 years. And after talking to them about 15, 20 minutes, I'd come to the conclusion that they had about two years' work experience. Because they'd, they'd essentially done the same thing for about 15 years. And to, to uh, Jeff's point, um, you, need, you need people that can do a lot of things, particularly, as we say, in the 0 to 10 and the the zero to 20 sort of range. I think probably my experience in the 30 years I've been doing this, the number of people that have successfully transitioned from a really big company to run a startup is a null set. It's absolutely zero. Yeah, I, would, I would agree with that because a lot of our entrepreneurial clients will get somebody from General Motors. I had this one case in point. And a startup company will drool all over that candidate. This person has great best practices. Uh, they, they know how to work for a company and sell or market and take a part of market. And it, and it has failed miserably. So I would, I would back that comment up. I'd like to add one more thing. It's not just the high price future executives in your company. It's really all the people that you have in an early stage company, perhaps up to the first 25 or 50 or more. Um, and the companies that I've worked with we really try to establish a culture that's you know, almost like a family. And at the time you start to bring in people whose only career has been in a large company, you know, sometimes they'll just come in with a bit of a chip in their shoulder or a bit of cynicism just because of the way large corporations differ from small. And unfortunately that can have a negative effect on the people that you've really been trying to bring along you know, with a much different culture. Thank you, Richard. Did you have a thought? Yeah, I did, actually. Dick mentioned the idea and the importance of finding people who are not like you, and I agree with it. That's true when it comes to disciplinary background. But what you do need to find are team members who are like you in terms of your values, your ethics, your vision, and your role in this company. Um, and risk tolerance is another, another important one. So the inventor who may be, his mission may be to get this perfect gizmo out in the world and keep tinkering with it till it's flawless. And the CEO who says, I just want to grow this thing <laughs> through the roof in three or four years and exit. There's going to be a misalignment there. So you need to have that alignment at the outset. And I couldn't agree more. I think aligning cultures is critical. Um, but I also, I also think that when, when you bring on people, I look for two things. I, I see two types of people in my companies. I see people that have a job, and that's what they want. They want to get a job, and they want to be done. And I see people with passion. And I'm going to hire to the passion every time. They want, they, they, want, they want to be part of a startup environment. They want to learn from the people that are there that have done it. They want to learn the business. They want to help evolve the business because all startup companies evolve. They never stay the same. Even Google changed complete directions early on. And so you need people with a passion to look at the business, to look at the ecosystem so that they'll help you make decisions. Whether you take their word for it or not or whether you, you, you value their opinion, the fact of the matter, it's important to have people that have opinions 
and care. And I think to me that's the, that's the number one thing you need in an employee. So would you say that the, the passion trumps the big company experience? If someone had that big company experience but they were so passionate about your product or service that you would maybe put aside that concern about the big company background? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we just uh, we just sent out an offer letter today. A guy's 25 years at AT&T and he's a sales rep. And uh, he just came in, he, he looked at me, he says, I get what you're doing, I love what you're doing, you're transforming the way. And he spoke to me. And he goes, I'm so sick of AT&T where I'm just doing the same job over and over again. He's a very experienced sales guy. He's had five different promotions in, in, in the last six years. One last thought on the, yes, please, a question. I've got to throw this at you, though. No, I'll Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, they, they want you to use a microphone. <laughs> We're being recorded by Big Brother. Uh, yeah, so uh, my question is, uh, when you're in a position like that, it seems to me that not only you're looking at the passion of this human being who's standing in front of you saying, I get what you, all that kind of stuff, it seems to me you have to have an idea in your head or in, within your company, what are those values that are really important, that you're really clear in your head, what is your culture and what does that really look like? Because somebody could just come in and give you this passionate speech about blah, blah, blah. There was something in what he said that let you know that he's going to fit the culture of your business, right? And that's kind of what I, I'd like to kind of understand what it is that you've done in your company that helps you to really clearly align that. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, for my company, I, I, I don't know if you guys know not, a guy named Fritz Seifert, but he used to play for, <laughs> yep. for, for Bo, and he's got a company, and it's all about aligning values. And I fortunately have worked for some big companies, and I've been trained on having corporate values. We have values. We have a vision. And everybody knows what those values are. They're really simple. I mean, just for, for your own edification, one of them is no crybaby shit. <laughs> that, that's right on our wall in our office, no crybaby shit. And so you, you don't complain about anything, you don't cry if you have a problem with somebody, you don't, you don't talk behind their back, you take it to them, it's a family, that's, that's number two and I'm not going to tell you what number three is, but we all work together as a team. Yeah, I think that's very important, you can't just have the mission, vision, values up on the wall, you really have to live them breathe them and communicate them. It sounds like this candidate really picked up on that. Before we go on to the next topic about advisory boards, I want to stay on as far as this best practices of hiring somebody to work with a founder. Because one of the things that we were exploring is management experience versus startup experience, core competency versus industry experience. I, I heard Dick loud and clear about this passion. But I'm kind of wondering from some other folks, what, what do you rank highest if you've got your startup. Um, is it more important for you to find someone who has experience in the industry or experience in the functional area, be it sales, marketing, finance, HR? What, what's more important to you? I think it depends on what your stage is and really what you're doing um, and what their specific job function is going to be. Um, for, for specific things like, for example, a CFO, that's a fairly transferable um, skill set. And again, that's probably one area where I, I would be less disinclined to look at somebody that had only big company experience. But again, if you're looking at sales, uh, it depends on the technical complexity of what you're selling. I mean, in, in Dick's case, um, you know, they've got, they've got a lot of related um, sort of parallel areas that have very, very similar sort of sales models and similar sales products. So he's got a fairly wide area to, to, to choose from. If you're selling, um, say, medical devices, that's a pretty niche area. And so you've, you've got less, uh, less latitude there. Um, and the other thing is, if, if you're looking for a specific area like sales versus general management versus engineering versus product development, all of these things are slightly different. So you have to, everything's a little bit different. And, and to the culture issue, when you've only got one or two people, those people are the culture. So that's something to remember. I've seen more startups at the very, very earliest stages crater because people don't get along than any other single factor, usually more so than technology or anything else. So especially when you're looking at that first sort of core group of two to three to five people, 
being able to have a like mind and, and a, a common vision is really, really critically important. I don't know if any of you have other thoughts on that, but when do you think startup experience kind of trumps all this other background? In what sort of situation? When you have no money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you got to wash the car and make the coffee and, you know, take okay. out the garbage. Copies, clean up the garbage yeah. and go okay. uh, make a sales call. Good. You know, oh, boy, a bunch of questions. Um, I'm going to put this up. This gentleman here. I'm going to put this right here so you can just come and ask your question. When you say startup experience, does it matter whether the uh, startup worked or failed? Do you make a distinction? Depends on why it failed. And what you learn from it. Yeah, yeah. Right. big point, big point. Yeah, I, I, th I think that startups that have failed, you can learn probably as much from, if not more, than ones that were successful that didn't run any bumps. So I wouldn't hold it against anybody if they're in a startup that failed for you know, maybe non, you know, the wrong reasons, you know, being dishonest, what have you. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, and I want to hear your question, but I was going to make this point later. I want to make it now because I see entrepreneurs fail this all the time. Um, thank you. Uh, I was just making sure that we weren't going to war or something. No. <laughs> just been handed this announcement. Thank you, Mish. Yeah. Bring home milk. Yeah, right. Okay, got it. Um, do a background check. Do a background check and uh, criminal credit. That I've just seen entrepreneurs skip over. Well, I love this guy. He's passionate. We gotta hire him. You know, there's a, there's a exhibitor. I don't know if anybody from the Raymond Group is in this room, but we use the Raymond Group for background checks. It's very inexpensive. Do a background check, please. I happen to be an investigator, and I tell you right now, run background checks. It's very very critical. I've been a, an executive in a publicly traded company, and I've been involved in several startups. Like you, I've been a California entrepreneur as well. I used to run internet companies out there. And four things I've learned. One, whenever you can, hire a veteran. Veterans are de have the knowledge and the skill set to solve problems and accomplish missions. And if you get good quality people, they're going to be with you, and they're going to get the mission accomplished, period. And they're not going to whine. All right. So, second thing I've learned is that <clears throat> there are three questions I always ask every prospective employee, and I'm in the middle of organizing a new startup right now. First question right up off the bat, and this relates to background checks, how honest are you? Most people will sit and they'll think about that for a minute and they'll give you a number. I'm 95% honest. I'm 80% honest. It's that 5% that keeps me up all night worrying. <laughs> you either are or you aren't. And so if they answer with, a, quanti with a, uh, a quantitative response, they're off the list immediately. You either are or you aren't. Second question I ask everybody, and it's worked wonders throughout my career, is if I'm doing something to screw up, do you have enough guts to come up to me and tell me to go F myself? If they're that assured of themselves, I want them on the team. If they hesitate, you don't want them. And the third and final question I ask every prospective employee is, do you want my job? And if they don't want the job, they're not on the team. Because I want highly motivated people that are going to walk through walls to be able to make things happen. So those three questions, along with some background checking, helps an awful lot. Some interesting points. Thank you, Thank you Patrick. Any responses or thoughts to those items? Uh, Paul? What? Paul? Well, uh, uh, or Jeff, whatever. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I play two roles here. Um, well, I, I appreciate the, the um, comment about the veterans. I'm not one, but I can certainly appreciate the fact that some of the people we've hired, you know, come from the military and they're really the can-do type people. So I, I second that. Um, as far as honesty, I guess that's something that in our culture, that is, you know. The only way, as part of that, maybe the the, uh, the test that, that Dick talks about, is that if I'm doing something that doesn't seem right, doesn't seem ethical, you know, I want somebody to tell me. Because I may screw up, and I don't want to be finding out six months later that, oh, you know, you shouldn't have done that. You know, I'd rather know it right now. Yeah, you really don't want employees to mitigate to you. That's what you're talking about. 
Because you, you want them to challenge you, you want them to call you out on things that are in your blind spot. That stuff is, is very helpful. The thing that I, I would like to hear the panel kind of respond to is this idea of do you want my job? Because I think that applies in because I, I think that applies in some situations but not others. And I just kind of wondered if we could explore that a little bit. I had a guy that wanted my job and he was horrible. I mean, he, he didn't listen to anything I said because he thought he should have my job. I mean, it was like ridiculous. And that, that became obvious really quickly. Um, you know, I, I, I think all of this is very simple. It goes down to creating a culture that you believe in, in your team, getting the people to join in with you as a team to try to make or accomplish this mission, whatever it is, and find somebody, if it's not you, that's really good at laying out objectives and strategies to get there. And then having the players of all the functional areas, the best player possible to help you move down that path. And it's, and it's really, um, to me, it's that simple. But it's not simple at all in execution. Good. Good. Any other thoughts on that? <laughs> You're itching to ask a question? Yes. But it has to be in English. <laughs> not, not in Portuguese, <laughs> please. Um, so when, when it was kind of your nucleus of the founders, you know, the technical founder, the, the finance, whatever, the two or three of you that founded your companies, um, when you were making the first hire, as a practical question, what kind of channels did you use to find that candidate? All right, well, I've got a funny story about that. When I do uh, <laughs> lectures at the University of Michigan, I go through some questions and how do you recruit people? I had a nice little slide that says, our strategy for hiring people is to grow them from birth. Uh, if you can't wait that long, that's a bit of a problem. But my, my most recent endeavor is actually a company that my son and three other uh, students from University of Michigan founded. So I guess it was hire your dad. You know, that, that's a way of doing it. I, I, I find the best sort of uh, employees I've ever gotten are word of mouth. I mean, there's just nothing beats aggressive networking. And, you know, that's, that's usually how you'll find the best people. And it has to be really, really aggressive and proactive. Um, you know, some people are better at it than others. Well, but when it comes to team building, there's a, the easy way to do it and the right way to do it. And oftentimes the easy way is, <laughs> Paul's the exception, the easy way is friends and family. But be very careful about that because they say uh, it's dangerous. It's too many relationships to have to navigate. You're, you're better off. Uh, in fact, on a hierarchy of best places to look, try our coworkers that you work with, maybe students you've been with, uh, strangers, and then friends and family. Uh, in terms of stability of, of, the, of the team. There's, there's more conflict, oddly enough, you know, with strangers or just, you know, prior coworkers. But it's, it's healthy conflict because you get the issues out. With friends and family, you don't want to offend them. You suck it up, and then it blows up. And by the way, you can also hire Todd's company. <laughs> or Todd's. This well, is true. well, yeah, this, I, is, what I, this is what I do every, every day. And so I'll give away some ideas. Uh, I think entrepreneurs are notoriously, you know, shoot, aim, fire. I mean, they're just doing it uh, from the seat of their pants. So I always advise people, first of all, write the job description. Seems like a very simple thing. Well, we just need a guy who can sell for us. Okay, well, that's great. But write the job description. Who are you selling to? What are your channels? What are your markets? And then get it out there. Uh, I think Richard makes a really good point that friends and family, it, it can be challenging. Uh, we are a second generation recruiting business and we work with a lot of multi-generational companies and there are a lot of familial issues that can get in the way. So you gotta have the no BS discussion. If you're gonna bring a friend or family member into the company, be very transparent about what you are and are not <laughs> going to accept. Just make it hurt in the beginning because that's the most important way to do. And then you've got LinkedIn and Ann Arbor Spark and you've got all these different media to go to to find people, which is absolutely fantastic. But just because we're in such a digital age, if you write the job description and get it out there, you'll be amazed. 
But when you get the 200 resumes and you need somebody to go through them, give me a call. Okay. Yeah, I just want to sort of follow up my, my first point. In most of my companies, if not all of them up to this current one, we had a pretty strict policy of not hiring family. Um, just because there are so many conflicts there. You know, That's why his son's the CEO of the company. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, maybe, Real good there, Paul. <laughs> well, yeah, he-, he I was kidding. He, he kicked me upstairs. I'm just chairman at this okay, point. Okay, but, okay. You know, I, we've, we've been in situations with our companies where you've got the wife that's the accountant and the daughter-in-law that's doing this, and they may be absolutely qualified for what they're doing, but other people in the company won't believe that. And they'll always think, are they getting a little bit of special treatment or are they being overlooked for certain things? And it probably just isn't worth you know, the hassle unless it just happens to be the top brain surgeon in the world. You need a brain surgeon and the only one that happens to be your brother. But with that exception, I'd, I'd actually stay away from it. I just came from four years of running a venture capital fund. And even if it is the top brain surgeon in the world, you will not get funded. Absolutely not. Venture capital sees family members, too many family members in a company, and it's, nope. Yeah. And I will, I'll tell you that there is a lot of ageism within corporate America, and a lot of folks that happen to be over a certain age are ignored. And I think they're a fantastic wealth of information and knowledge. And that's a great place to go start, a great place. And they're out networking, gray hair management, Execunet. They're out there. And uh, they're a wealth of, of information and help. And, and if I could add one more piece of advice. Um, a, as a salesperson, um, as a guy that negotiates a lot of contracts, you want to have a good hand. And the only way you're going to hire a great salesperson is to talk, like in sales, to 20 of them. And so if you want to hire somebody, talk to a lot of them. And don't just find the first one that walks in the door. So your position, your hand is much better if you've talked to 10 or 15 people for that interview because you'll start seeing the nuances and how one might fit versus the other one. So, uh, you know, uh, pe people make it... Um, you know, they'll see somebody that might be close and they'll hire them right away. And it's much more important to hire somebody um, that you vetted and, and that you can compare against a lot of other people and you're sure they're the best out there. Just to give you some, some numbers, um, the minimal amount of candidates that we'll look at for a search is 200. That's just resumes, 200 resumes. And we're usually meeting face to face with at least 10 to 20 candidates, to your point. Yep. That's, it's good to have comparison. And the other thing I would suggest is we got lucky. We're, we're closing around to funding. We've got 10 new hires we're hiring. And last night we're, we had a meeting at 4 o'clock. How are we going to find these people? And we got home at 11 o'clock and found out 4C just laid off 50 people. <laughs> now 4C is in our space. They're in, they sell software. They sell the same type of software. They're in our ecosystem. They sell the same size. They've got the culture we're looking for. And we just hit a gold mine. And how many other times in your life have you ever been able to go in now into LinkedIn and I look and see 4C, I do a search for 4C sales reps, New York, San Francisco, and Chicago, and I had a list of 20 people at my fingertips within 15 seconds. And there's a Challenger Gray and Christmas, which is an outplacement firm. They publicly will they publish who is downsizing, so that might be a way to follow that path. What was the name of that again, please? Challenger, Gray, and Christmas, they're an outplacement firm, and they track and publish those. I, I deselected their uh, newsletter a while ago because I get too many, but it might be helpful. Any last thoughts on that before we go to the last topic, which is a, we want to do one more topic, and then we're going to open it up to any free-for-all questions. So the last topic, good. Yep is on advisory boards. Um, because when you have your startup entrepreneurial entity, an advisory board, you're recruiting your team for that as well. An advisory board, we'll, we'll hear a little bit about this because this is Richard's, this is Richard's big area, but I'm sure everybody can talk about it. But we wanted to hear a little bit about 
risks and be benefits and how much equity do we want to give and talk a little bit about vesting schedules so we could we could let Richard loose and just kind of let him go and go see what happens. Yeah, right, right. You can sure. talk a little bit about that and then other Thanks. folks can chime in. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be I'll be brief. First of all, we're not talking about a scientific advisory board. A lot of early stage companies have those. That's a roster of talented scientists who will from time to time, you know, offer inputs on the technology. This is actually like a functioning board of directors, except that it doesn't have any voting. There's no power to vote or hire or fire the CEO, uh, but it, in every other respect, it functions the same way. Um, there, I don't think there are a lot of risks in having this advisory board. So the notion is you pick two or three talented business people with uh, backgrounds in some of the core challenges you're you know, struggling with. You name them to an advisory board with two or three of the executives in the company. You meet on a regular cycle. For second stage companies, it's typically quarterly. For an early stage company, it might be monthly. And you have a set agenda, and you go through all the issues that you can talk about for an afternoon, and you adjourn. And there's uh, action steps that are assigned to various management people. And then when you meet again, the very first thing you do is go over the action steps and figure out what progress did you make. Uh, for a second stage company, you always run the numbers. How did you do last quarter? What are the ratios? Uh, what are the receivables? Those sorts of things. But I can't think of any risks in doing that, except you pick the wrong advisor who labs your technology to, <laughs> to the world. Have, have, if, have any of the other panelists ever had a, a bad experience with an advisor? I mean, the risk that you take is you spend a lot of time getting them and talking to them and they bring no right. value. Right. Or they give yeah. you value and you don't listen to it. I mean, right. and, and I've seen that before with plenty of companies. But that, those are the you can set it up so you can get rid of them if you don't like them. But Absolutely. you know, make sure that you are finding people that are going to add value to your company and ask them and then take their don't always take their advice, but take their input and process it. Do you have to pay them? You know, in my experience, yes, you do because if you're not paying them, they're not valuing them, and. But you can pay them with stock. You can pay them with equity, right. And, and the question of how much equity to give them is, is much like how much equity do you give your CFO or, or one of your part-time advisors or something. Can you fire them too? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, when I set these up. How do you fire someone who you've given equity to? Pardon me? How do you fire someone who you've given equity to? Oh, that goes to vesting. Vesting, vesting, vesting. vesting. <laughs> oh, that's OK. You, when you give them the equity, you have them sign a restricted stock agreement that says if you leave before a certain period of time, um, and for your founders team, it's typically like four years, you're going to give back some of the stock. So if you leave in the first year, you give back all the stock. If you leave in the next three years, you give back a portion of it. So, the, but, we but another, we to, to the part that is vested, they own it. That's part of having them there. Um, just hearing that comment then, you know, you could also comprise that group of your own infrastructure, being i.e. your accounting firm, your, uh, your existing lawyer, um, maybe your banker, your insurance group could act as your advisement group. If, you're, if they're all thinking along the same accord as you are as the owner of that company, you can develop your team that way, which I've seen done and work very effectively. They're, but you're already paying them by the services they're providing. And if you like the services providing, so you said, OK, I need to bring, bring this coalition of, of teammates together, thereby getting away from it from that equity standpoint. So that's a method of doing it as well. Yeah. Sure. That's an interesting point. Yeah. I, and I'd be interested in, in any reactions. If you have your accountant, your attorney, uh, your banker all in the same room, have you seen <laughs> entities do this? Well, I have. It's yeah. a great practice. And you can actually invite your accountant and your lawyer to show up for that, and if they say no, they're crazy. <laughs> because it's a great way to build a relationship to no, help no, to, no. to facilitate my understanding of the business. If I know the market you're pursuing, what the challenges are, I can do a much better sales rep agreement, distribution agreement, et cetera, than if you just call me on the phone and it's from scratch, sure. basically. But you do want more than just your professionals or your advisors. You want somebody who's like Dick Beaton will look in the eye and say, you're crazy. 
Why do you do it that way? No, he is so sweet. <laughs> You're more colorful. No, that's right. Patrick, welcome back. Something I learned back in the 70s, and I've used it a few times during my career that works well, and it's like advisory boards. I picked this up. Uh, has anybody here ever remember the book? Well, most of you are too young, but remember the book Up the Organization by Robert Townsend. He was a former chairman of Avis Rent-A-Car, and he had a great idea in there, and I've actually used it along with an advisory board. As, as a CEO, you get hit all the time with people that you don't need to be wasting time on. All right, they want to make a pitch for some such thing. So what you do is you get a retired guy in, a retired business guy who's got some fair amount of time on his hands. And you tell him, Charlie, I'm going to give you some money and you're going to have some great lunches. But get these people out of my hair, all right? And you give them the title Chairman of the Executive Committee. So when somebody calls, well, you know, I'm really tied up, but I'm going to give you the Chairman of the Executive Committee to deal with this. And they, people think they're dealing with somebody who's got some almighty power and very on high level. All you're doing is picking up the lunch tab for a retiree to help the guy out. Right. All right? Solves a lot of problems. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Never heard of that. Never heard of that. Good but... technique. <laughs> I'll give it some thought. It works. How, how do you determine how much equity to give an advisory board member? How do you work that out? You know, it, in my well, you know, so in my, in my opinion, it's it's who they are, how much commitment they're going to make to the business, how well connected they are. Um, if they're meeting once a quarter with you for an afternoon, and that's really it, and they don't know a whole lot of people. You know, half a point, maybe something like that, or a quarter of a point. If there's somebody who are going to be working very hard for you. They're, they know everybody, a lot of insights. It could be 5%. There's a guy in this room just like that that I can think of yeah. sitting right there. Terry, yeah. right? So anyway, yeah. that's, that's how I would look at it. And it's really the same analysis you use in deciding um, equity for your founding team. I mean, part of it's opportunity cost, too. Right. If, if you're getting uh, the, the chairman of GM, who could be doing a lot better things with his or her time, uh, it's going to cost you more than that. Right. Just to give you a sense, because somebody asked a question about paying the advisory board, we, we had an advisory board and met four times a year, and we paid each of the advisors $500 to, to show up. And in a lot of cases, they just donated it to the charity of their choice. It wasn't, it wasn't about the money for them, obviously. It was, uh, it was about helping us. And they were, Past clients and friends, so that's the way to do it. It was a lot of fun. Thank you, Terry. Yeah. Yeah. Terry's available for hire for your advisor. But yeah, <laughs> flock them, get them. Yeah. Okay, so uh, any other thoughts on advisory boards? Good? No, thank you. All right, before we just kind of do a general open to the floor and allow people to ask questions, any other final thoughts on the team, the team, and the team that we did not get to address that you? have experienced and you wanted to make sure to share your wisdom with this August group. I want to make a plug for a book oh. that I read last week called Slicing Pie by Mike Boyer. Slicing Pie, Mike Boyer. He's a big fan of this completely dynamic method of dividing equity among the founders, even to the point of having a massive spreadsheet where you put in how many hours did you work this week and how much money did you contribute. And how many assets did you contribute? And the theory is um, it's a fair way of allocating equity. Everybody sees why they ended up with what they ended up with. I, I recommend it to you not because I want you to go get the spreadsheet and start filling it out. I think it's a little too anal. But it walks you through what's important to think about when you decide giving up, uh, giving out equity. So it's a quick read. I like it. One of the uh, one of the best little uh, blogs I've seen lately was came out about I don't know somebody passed it to me a few weeks ago I can't remember exactly the uh, the title but it was something like uh, selecting business partners is like marriage without sex sure. um, and it was actually a really well done article it's something of that if you if you uh, if you um, Google that you'll probably run across it but basically what he was talking about was um, you know, what, a lot of what we've been talking about here, you know, make sure you vet the people, make sure that there's an alignment and so on and so forth. But the other thing is, make sure you write down and you have a very hard agreement up front what people, what you expect from somebody, 
and what they'll get in return. Very, very good people should be well compensated. Um, but otherwise, they're going to walk off and do something else. And, and you want them as part of your team. But the other, the other side of that is they have to understand what the expectations are and what they expect to get in return. And make sure that that's very clear starting out. Most of the entrepreneurs I deal with at the very earliest stage, I usually advise them, make sure that you've got it very clearly put down in writing what the division of equity is, at least at the start, because it's very easy to divide zero. Once you move off zero, it's really hard. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Paul. Any final thoughts, Paul? We had a rule that we, unfortunately, wouldn't hire people without any experience. The great person just out of school. And the, the reason for that was that we didn't have the resources that a big corporation would have for training. And frankly, for people that are right out of school, with all due respect, they don't understand corporate culture and how business works enough so that um, they can appreciate always um, and what's going on in the business. And so I'd, I'd much rather have somebody that worked somewhere else for just a year or maybe two. And there's been people I've hired, I wish I could just tell them, go get another job for a year and then come back because you're really smart. But I'd rather have you learn you know, a little bit more about the industry or the business or something else. So this is like your algae. Time. You really like to grow things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right? Send them off to college and get right. graduated. Okay. Dick, any final thoughts? No, I think that Andy's uh, point was really good. You have to set expectations for your, your employees. They, they have to know what you expect of them. The job description is very key. Um, not only the job description, but the, the work ethic, uh, the culture within the company, make sure that there's a, 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 a good alignment there. And th those things are really important to discuss before they're hired instead of after they're hired. Yeah, I think the, the comments today about culture is a great place to start because you really got to live it and breathe it in order to communicate it. And that passion not only works this way, Dick was talking about a candidate who had passion this way, and he turned on to it and wanted to hire that person, but the passion also goes that way. And so you need to communicate that passion to your candidate pool. So you got it's got some great comments here from Dick about passion. Um, we're gonna, oh, I'm supposed to make this uh, announcement, and I wanted to make it before people dissipated, and we, I know we're gonna have some questions. But since Mish handed this to me, and uh, she, I, Mish was my, uh, when I was like six, in sixth grade, she was my camp counselor, so I do anything she says. <laughs> Many of you received a giving card from DonorsChoose.org. This card has an allotment of $10 for you to give to any educational program listed on the DonorsChoose.org site. Please find out more about redeeming the cards before you leave. There will be volunteers at the registration desk to help you understand the process and the power your $10 can wield. I actually saw a vine about that. That was kind of interesting. So uh, we've gone through the topics that we wanted to go through. We have about six minutes left. Like I said, one of my problems is that I always start on time, but I think we're going to spill over if you have a lot of questions. So yes. Please, right down the aisle. Yeah, I've worked in companies where people have worked, you know, 60 plus hour weeks and other places where they work 40 hour weeks. And I just wanted to hear your um, opinions or, um, you know, observations about culture and how that aspect um, has worked or not worked as far as cranking long hours. Hmm. Interesting. That's just not something you can dictate. It's got to be a company culture thing. And so if you, if you spend the time finding the right people, they're going to have passion and they're going to go home at night and they're going to read about your business or your, the business that you think you're in and learn more about it. And, and they're, they're, again, they're the kind of people that want a job and they're there to work to, to, to make their money and they'll work as few hours as they can. And then there are people that want to give you a lot more than that because they really care. And I think all of that is up front. And uh, if you find the right people that are passionate and uh, you vet them, you're going to get a really, really good uh, group of people that, um, you know. I, I bought a company when I first moved here 
called entire dock prep. They had 120 people, and they literally, if it was five below zero, they'd sit out in their car until eight o'clock sharp because they didn't want to be in the office to give the company an hour more than they needed to. And he, this guy had a time clock, and when you checked out, they checked out. I mean, you start seeing them rustling around at 4.45, 4.50, getting ready for 5 o'clock to walk out the door, and it was an exodus. And the hardest thing was changing that culture. And you did it by bringing in people that worked their asses off. And then they started to realize, if I want to stay around here, I'm going to work my ass off. And it was never anything we ever said to them. And it took a year, but that, it shifted dramatically in the first year. The other thing I would say is that, please come to the microphone if you have a question. The, the other thing I would say is that people work after hours in different ways. Uh, because I have some salespeople in my organization that will email and follow up on things till eight, nine o'clock at night, and I keep thinking, go to sleep, be with your family or something. And that's great, it's good passion like Nick's talking about. But then I have other employees who are more in research functions, and they're just thinking about things. And that provides a lot of value, just thinking about things, like Dick was saying, the research. So there's different ways that people can work 60 hours a week. Yes. When you just addressed uh, changing cultures within a group, that's already been established for a period of time, would you begin that by hanging a help wanted sign on the window? <laughs> Will you get rid of some of the people that you are, notice are uh, the first ones out the door, or at least the motivators of the exodus? Would you begin by those ob observations, and would you release them before, you, as you hung the, door, the sign on the doors for new people? Well, that's exactly what we did. We okay. said, we, we had a company meeting, said this is what we expect from people, we expect you to care. We expect you to be nice to people. We expect you to, you know, to, to have a passion for this company. And, you know, three months later, the first layoffs happened. Said, I'm sorry, this is the culture we have in this company. You don't meet it. And we're, 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 we're going to make a change. Yeah. You need to stick to that culture like to like stone, like glue. It's the, all about the culture. You know, Chen culture Chenard changed. in Patagonia did that whole thing with their yeah. their model, and that seemed to work well for the last 50 years. <coughs> yep. The hardest thing as a manager is actually firing people. I mean, it's a terrible thing to do. Nobody likes to do it. But the weak managers are the ones that won't do it. And you can't do <coughs> culture change unless you in some cases, unless you do that. When I was, did a startup in England, I had a guy, every time we tried to do something new, I had a manager who always said, well, that's not how we do things here. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, yes, it is. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> and he didn't last that long. But it was really, really hard to let him go. I mean, he was just about old enough to be my father. But, um, you know, they, it, you have to do that. And, and the one question, please, the one question uh, that, that was, well, one part of that that we didn't talk about was, do you have people waiting in the wings? Or do you just pull the cord and hope you can find the replacement? Depends how bad they are. Yeah, it depends, yeah. It, that yeah, yeah, it entirely yeah. depends. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, when you're, uh, trying to find the people to establish an advisory board, are you limited to the people you already know? Or could a strategy be to find like the top 10 gurus in your industry and see if any of them are interested in being, you know, strangers that could be interested in being on your advisory board? You start with people you don't know. You start exactly what you said, the top 10 gurus. Get the best people you can for anything. Right. And then right. ask them if they know anybody. Don't spin your wheels though. I mean, don't ask, uh, Obama to be on your board. I mean, literally, I mean, I, you got to be honest with yourself and pick people that will listen to you and that you think could add value. <laughs> but be confident about what you're asking, well, you also what you're doing. Fast. That's the, right there. Yeah. the best person you can pick in many respects is the, guy, the entrepreneur who's five steps ahead of you. Right? Uh, the guy who's closed his first round of funding if you're a startup. Yeah, people, they'll offer that perspective. Yeah, to support that, people always ask me, Todd, how do you change careers from automotive to whatever? Ask somebody who's done it. 
So get somebody who's done it. Okay, one last burning question, or we will adjourn. Going once. You answered all their questions. Way to go. Let's give our panel a round of applause. For you. I'm sure uh, everyone will hang out for a minute.